Um, I see that we have a quorum. And uh, and so I am going to um, both welcome everybody back. It's good to see uh, so many of you, even if I am not seeing uh, you in person. But um, there's been a lot going on. And since we have been unable to meet because of uh, the COVID pandemic, and then we are also responding to other um, well, let's, I'll, I'll refer to it as a pandemic as well, right? Uh, when we're dealing with questions of, of um, public health and safety. And one of the questions of public safety is, of course, um, how people relate with each other um, as we are going through our daily lives. And if it's unsafe for us to uh, be able to go out and to live our normal lives, then it is very hard for us to um, to deal with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's part of what um, we as a country have been dealing with. And uh, for, for those of you who have friends in other places, um, you know, outside of Amherst, outside of the US, um, you know, I, I have uh, friends who are contacting me from around the globe who are saying um, how horrific it must be to be in the United States at this moment. Um, I don't know that it is terribly different than it would normally be, but let's let's uh, go on from from that. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to take a look at the agenda, um, and uh, had a chance to review it. Um, and if there were any comments with regard to it, uh, we did not put on here a, um, a review of. The minutes from our February meeting. It's been it's been a good long while um, since we've been together, and that would probably be a good thing to have done. But uh, I don't have that information right now with me, and I didn't think about it until, of course, we got into meeting mode, and all of a sudden said, "Hey, that's something we would normally take care of right at the beginning of the meeting." Um, but that said, uh, you will see we have a pretty full agenda. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I, I want to give us a chance to, uh, to get to it. Um, before we get to the agenda, I first um, want to make sure that there is nothing uh, on the agenda that you have uh, questions about. Obviously, we're going to talk through uh, the issues on there. I believe that we are starting off when we get to uh, action discussion items with some of the uh, the matters that will involve some of the attendees who um, will want to speak on uh, questions relating to uh, the Civil War plaques, uh, Juneteenth, uh, other events that we have coming up like the Frederick Douglass speech, um, as well as uh, the wage uh, bylaw proposal and the non-discrimination statement uh, proposal. So uh, we have a number of people who are uh, calling in who will be participating uh, a bit, but I want to open it to public comment first, unless uh, any of the commissioners have something that they uh, would want to speak to with regard to additions to the agenda. Uh, Gezi Chaya. I just wanted to make sure who's taking um, the minute or the note. That's a great question. Okay, thank uh, you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. I just, I rem I only remembered after you began talking, like <laughs> sort of three or four minutes into it, like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be taking notes. It's been months, but I think I got it all. Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you. you. Um, other uh, statements or um, remarks with regard to uh, things that, that um, may have been errors on the agenda, anything like that before we open it up to public comment for uh, a five minute period. I just wanted to also make sure I think there's one participant who's calling in by phone and there's a specific way to like raise a hand. Um, that it's was star nine. Okay. Um, so I know that Tracy wanted to speak under the public comment in regards to the resolution. So if you guys are ready for that. That would be fine. That is uh, with regard to the uh, non-discrimination statement. 
Um, and so if, if uh, Tracy Zafian is interested in speaking, we'd be uh, excited to hear. Um, can I also just ask for Tracy to spell her name? Oh, there it is. Okay, got it. Okay. Hi. So I don't know, I don't see my picture, but you can hear me? Yes, yes we can. Excellent. Oh. And um, okay, so um, my name is Tracy Zafian. I'm a 20 year resident of Amherst. I live in the center of Amherst, uh, precinct for District 3 and I work at UMass. Um, and so I uh, had been in touch with the chair and Jennifer a little bit before the meeting about a resolution that I had been working on with somebody else relating to um, anti-Asian discrimination and harassment. Um, that's something that we've been working on for a little while um, since like the, you know, starting in April, but it had been talked about earlier. Um, Northampton just passed a similar resolution and there's also once before the US Congress with both the House and the Senate. Um, and it really came out of, you know, the conversations that we were having before, like all these recent incidents. Um, but they do relate back to the, um, <clears throat> like what's going on politically in this country in terms of blaming others, you know, blaming people of different color, blaming people of different race, ethnicity, immigrants, and so on. And so um, it was just designed to, um, you know, to just reiterate that we're a welcoming, inclusive community and that those types of incidents aren't okay in our community. Um, you know, there have been a few um, high profile incidents in Amherst, like including there was the PBTA bus incident in January where there were graduate students who were, you know, yelled at for speaking Chinese. Um, you know, there's also recently, I, I mean, I know that I was definitely thinking a lot more about the resolution after there was a like a pro-Trump rally, which they had called the Chinese virus uh, freedom rally or something, you know, by some supporter over in Northampton. So, I mean, that stuff is just really offensive language and it really sets the tone. Um, Dr. Franklin Odo, who lives in Amherst as well, and he's an Amherst College professor. He also has a big history. Um, of doing, I know he had been in the Smithsonian, um, looking at Asian American history and so on. And, um, you know, he reports an incident where a student of his like felt so unsafe in Amherst that there were three different incidents that this Amherst College student experienced. And even though she had asked to stay on campus for the spring semester, she ended up leaving because she just felt so unsafe in Amherst. Um, so I was just coming with, you know, because this really falls under a lot of the types of things that the Human Rights Commission looks at, um, we wanted, I didn't know whether the Human Rights Commission would be meeting. Like I know in Northampton, it didn't go to the Human Rights Commission because they weren't meeting because of coronavirus. Um, but we wanted to share it with you and get feedback if you had any. And then it would also go to the JOL, the GOL of the town council, the governance organization legislation um, subcommittee, and then go to the council for a vote. And in, in Northampton, it passed anonymously unanimously, sorry. So um, if there's any comments or questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thank you so much, Tracy. I'm wondering if we can share screen on the statement? Um, so I, I can try. Um, Here, let me try and give her permission. Sorry, I'm being, the dog is trying to. So Tracy, does it give you the chance to do it now? So it says, okay, here's on share screen. Yeah. So do, can you see my screen then? Hold on. No. Okay. It just told me to share. It gives me a little, I'm trying to share the screen. Uh, hold on. Let me see if I can. Uh, okay. Here it is. Okay. Can you see it now? Okay. Yes, thank you. Yay, okay. All right, so um, the language in this resolution, I mean, it could be tightened up a little, but I based it mainly on the Northampton one. It was just, you know, reiterating Amherst's history of looking at these issues um, and some of the negative language, you know, that's been used with Asian Americans. And I'm trying to scroll down. Hold on. I don't know if it's going to let me. And then, you know, just in terms of actions that could be taken in Amherst just to, you know, make the statement and, um, 
I mean, it's not really about statement at this point, you know, in terms of, you know, recognizing the standing with the community and condemning all anti-Asian racism um, and sharing it with, um, you know, our Congress people, our state reps and senators, as well as the people in Congress who've also been advocating for the same um, resolutions. Um, I mean, I will say that, you know, in writing it, I think, and this conversation came up a little bit at the council meeting on Monday, is that I really see these types of resolutions, just like the resolution related to George Floyd as like starting places and not an ending place, right? It's just to reiterate and set the stage and then to also come up with some more concrete actions to support these members of our community. So I had sent a PDF of the, um, the resolution to the chair as well as to Jennifer. So, I mean, they could email that around if that's something that people want to look at. Or I could send it again. Well, no, I did, I did send it out. Okay. Yeah, yeah that has been shared um, with the commissioners for okay. uh, purposes of just knowing um, what, what we would be discussing tonight, not necessarily for uh, us to approve it per se um, mm -hmm. tonight because uh, obviously we uh, are in a position where we could, um, I, I think we can certainly discuss it. And uh, this is our first time meeting, of course, since February. And so uh, we haven't had a chance to uh, discuss what process we would follow uh, for, for this kind of, of statement. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it probably would go without saying that the Human Rights Commission is um, is supportive of anything that uh, would work against discrimination and uh, against uh, racial, ethnic, uh, other animus against any group within the town of Amherst and more broadly. So, um, so thank you for uh, for speaking on that. We we are going to speak to it further um, as an agenda item in just a little bit. Um, but we have to uh, allow for um, if there's any other public comment. But uh, but thank you for the introduction. I think it's incredibly no, helpful you. for you to to um, to describe exactly the intent and and a little bit of the history of where this this is coming from. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there other uh, others who want to uh, speak during our? public comment period. Um, can Tracy stop sharing her screen because I can't get back to my Word document? <laughs> yeah, yep. there we go. There we go, thank you. She actually said, I think that she was had to leave. Um, is she still, are you still there, Tracy? Yeah, um, I can okay. stay on for a little while. I mean, if you, I mean, I guess a big question, I mean, just in terms of the process of this is, hey. if, if the if the Human Rights Commission hey. <laughs> please continue. Um, if the Human Rights Commission wants to like take any official vote or anything on it, um, because you know, as I was saying, after this step, it would go to the JOL and then it would go to the council. I know the JOL meets just like twice a month or so. So um, just in terms of you know whether it's a statement that we want to. I mean, I know that the statement that was made about George Floyd um, by the council the other day. You know, it just came right out of the council. It came right from the counselors. It didn't go through like the standard procedures in terms of, and I think that that's appropriate. Um, it's just, you know, do we want to try to pass something in June or July or whenever, right? So that's just something on my mind a little bit. Well, you know, I, I can just say first off that um, a, a number of us um, just talking with other individuals have been aware of this, uh, this issue and, um, I don't think anyone appreciates any type of um, of animus, of of hate, um, of disparagement of a group for no reason other than to score points with the political base. Now, again, we are an apolitical body ourselves. Um, while we do um, represent the, the town of Amherst in looking at these issues, we don't come at it from uh, supporting a political party or um, or going against a particular uh, individual as horrific as that person um, or people uh, might be in a particular circumstance. Um, but I, I 
will say that, um, again, we have it a little bit later down on, on the agenda. I think it's great during public comment for, especially if you can't stay for, for the entirety of the meeting and, and uh, wouldn't be available later. Um, it, it's good for us to hear from you. As far as a vote, I, I think we would need to look at uh, what we would be asked to do. Um, I think it's more likely that we would get a sense of the Human Rights Commission and um, might express our approval for the, um, the premise of the document. That is, that we would express uh, support for anti-discrimination, uh, which is what our role is in any event. So, um, and we could express that uh, in some manner, whether it's uh, perhaps sending a representative to speak when a, uh, a committee is hearing uh, something on this issue or whether it is just making a, a general written statement in support. Um, but that would likely be the, the next step coming from us. Um, it would just be some type of show of support for the statement. Uh, but I, I'd need to hear from everybody else before we figure out exactly what that would look like. No, oh, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was nodding my head the whole time, but I'm not on okay. screen, so thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I have to ask if there's anyone else, though, who uh, wanted to speak during the public comment period. I know that we have uh, Dr. D. Shabazz and Dr. Amalkar Shabazz uh, and others uh, as speakers when we are looking at the Civil War plaques in Juneteenth. Um, so I would not ask you to speak at this point because you're, you're going to be speaking on the agenda in a few minutes. Um, but is there anyone else who wanted to speak during public comment? I did hear that there, I got a text of somebody else is trying to speak on this during public comment. Yeah, uh, MP. I, uh, who's MP? Um, her name is Megan Peck and she's, um, ah. she's, so go ahead and you can let her speak. Yes, please. Hi, could everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? Hi, um, I just uh, stumbled upon this meeting and um, I'm a, my name is Megan Peck. I'm actually a resident of Northampton and a member of the Human Rights Commission there. And um, I'm here to hopefully um, say a few words uh, about um, how our resolution um, came to being. Um, I worked with a couple of our city councilors um, on the drafting of this. I am myself a member of the AAPI group. And um, um, I, there were two counselors who were, who were interested in this issue following some informal uh, reports of harassment downtown of people who appeared at AAPI. Um, and this was shortly before the um, MAGA rally was um, scheduled to take place in Northampton. Um, so I just wanted to add that, um, to, to also acknowledge that we are clearly living in time with so many other, so many other priorities and so many other abuses and hurt upon many other minority groups, in particular um, Black Americans. Um, and this, having, putting forth this resolution, I hope in no way negates our recognition of that. And it's simply um, the opportunity was presented to us and I wanted to, um, as a representative of the Human Rights Commission and a member of this group, um, um, give it my personal support. Um, so I, um, I would like, it is clearly a small local action. And, um, you know, for us in Northampton, resolutions are really just a statement, a restatement of our values as a community. So um, thank you for your time. Um, and um, thank you to Tracy Zafian for, um, letting me know about this meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I do think it is helpful to sometimes repeat um, 
perspectives across uh, different communities. Um, I, many years ago, um, worked in uh, communications on AIDS policy uh, in the, uh, as an intern in the Clinton administration. Um, and uh, before that was, was a page in the House of Representatives. And one of the things that I had the opportunity to see was the collection of communications from all around the country of people wanting to speak on a particular issue and, um, and just people keeping track of uh, how many people from different communities care about an issue, want to speak on it, and believe that their representatives should speak uh, on those issues. So I, I think uh, Amherst doing something in this vein, uh, as Northampton has, uh, would be the, the one way of saying that we as a community believe that um, discrimination against Asian American Pacific Islanders uh, and others during this period of time is uh, incredibly problematic. And, and we certainly would demand of our leaders that they be aware of it and respond to it. Um, so again, we're gonna speak to that uh, more in a few minutes to figure out exactly how we as a commission would want to respond and what that response would look like. Um, we are almost 16 minutes into a, a five minute public comment period. Um, so I'm going to um, close the co public comment period so that we can move on to the items that are on our agenda so that we are actually able uh, to get to those items. But I wanna thank uh, both of the speakers in the public comment period for, uh, for presenting on, on that particular item. Uh, and I think that will inform some of our discussion uh, around it later. Um, let's move on and let's start off uh, with the Civil War plaques and the Juneteenth uh, discussion. So um, I believe that uh, we have a, a number of individuals who wanted to speak on that. And I, I don't know if you have a, a way that you wanted to uh, speak, uh, but, or, or an order in which to speak, but if we could hear uh, on the, those topics now, I would love to hear from them. Uh, okay. Dr. Shabazz. Hi, so this is Dr. Demetria Shabazz, or D. Shabazz, uh, as opposed to Milkar Shabazz, the other doctor. Yep. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not certain how uh, much folks know about Juneteenth, and so I first wanted to just give a brief, real quick description of historically what Juneteenth is, and then um, just real quick uh, let you know uh, the history of celebrating it here in the town. And then uh, Dr. Amilkar Shabazz will uh, talk about uh, why we're meeting with you all about Juneteenth, and then how that is important in terms of framing the history uh, and celebrating the history, local history with the plaques, okay? So thank you, uh, first off, for um, uh, allowing us to speak with you all. Um, and um, real quick, Juneteenth is um, something that's very uh, personal to me, as well as um, I think a lot of African Americans uh, here and nationwide. I actually am from Galveston, Texas, where Juneteenth, um, in a way, first originated. Um, it was announced in 1865 by General Granger in Galveston that um, we were emancipated as enslaved uh, African people. And um, this was something really significant in terms of there was not a national uh, celebration, so to speak, uh, that uh, was, was created in order to recognize and celebrate our emancipation. And so at the, after this 1865 announcement, people started slowly creating their own celebrations within particularly the state of Texas. And so Galveston, uh, Houston, Texas, um, 
this became something that folks did yearly. My husband and I are both from Texas. He's from Beaumont, I'm from Galveston. Um, and we celebrated this, um, this event um, as a family, as a community. And when we moved here 13 years ago, <laughs> um, we uh, ended up, uh, I guess, finding, so, so to speak, the family of Vera Cage uh, and Ed Cage. And they were celebrating, um, creating a, a Juneteenth celebration. And so we joined with them along with other community members to now yearly recognize um, this particular uh, historical event and to kind of celebrate it like our, our 4th of July, so to speak. Um, so um, I wanted to first let you all kind of know the history of that, that we have been celebrating this. Um, it's been getting bigger each year and we don't want to stop it, I guess, because of the quarantine and the COVID. I think in many ways we need Juneteenth. Um, we need Juneteenth now more than ever. Um, and so I want to now, I guess, pass it to my, my partner here, uh, the other doctor, and then he'll uh, talk a bit about the history. Thank you. Um, so 10 years ago, uh, Juneteenth was started here in the Valley, here in um, Amherst by Ed Cage and uh, Vera Cage and others who worked with them. Um, it was held at Groff Park. Um, I went out there, in fact, I believe that's where I first met the, met the Cages. And um, then we joined with them after that in uh, 2011, 2012. Um, and as, as Diaz said, each year it got, a, got significantly bigger. Um, I think from the 2012 event, um, Reynold um, Winslow um, had uh, participated or come out. And, and so when we were planning the 2013 and we had requested the, the Amherst Commons right, off, right across from, the, from Town Hall, um, and uh, we were getting started on that, um, the uh, we met with this body, with the Human Rights Commission, and um, uh, discussed joining, joining forces. And um, Reynolds uh, Winslow, who had been a commission member since 1999, um, was um, saying that, they, that given the timing of the 19th of June, it would be perfect for them to uh, join with us in holding their um, uh, the, the, the commission's uh, recognition of uh, graduating high school, well, elementary age, all the way to, to graduating high school seniors. Um, and, um, and so we, we met um, down at the Bangs and uh, we discussed this and uh, it was agreed to work together. And, uh, and so on that day, on 2013, we called it the Juneteenth Jamboree. We had a lot of live music. We had dance performances. We had uh, jazz uh, ensemble, um, various speakers. Uh, it was uh, it was quite a quite a quite a nice event. But then it shifted at a certain point, and it went into the awards recognition. Eleven students uh, who had been nominated by their teachers received awards, and so the the commission sort of took over that part in doing that and then we closed out. We, for whatever reasons, didn't necessarily um, repeat on that every year. Um, and uh, we've moved around from different places. Last year, we returned to Groff Park and um, we had the support of uh, UMass uh, to provide food. They brought out, uh, uh, their, their chefs came and provided food for everyone. Um, we had African drumming and dancing. Um, it was a really nice event, yeah. But this year, as Dia said, in light of everything, we've, we've gone in a different direction, but we come to you tonight to, again, ask for your co-sponsorship uh, co and collaboration uh, with us. And um, we think it's consistent with the articles, Article 1, 2, and 3 of the, of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as, which, which with its stress on freedom of all human beings, but also Article 27, 
which uh, uh, everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and share in scientific advancements and its benefits. So in that regards, then, what mm -hmm. we've planned um, the, um, uh, with the town, um, we're going to tape uh, someone speaking the proclamation that, uh, that they've, uh, they've put together. Actually, I, correction, it was two years ago we were at Groff. Last year, we started at the steps of Town Hall oh, right. and went from Town Hall to Jones Library, and we were in the Woodbury Room. That's right. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and that was the first year we had a full-blown proclamation. We have another one that's um, for this year, and we want to tape someone from the town um, uh, reading the um, proclamation and, uh, and we'll tape uh, the ringing of the bells. And then on the 19th itself, we'll air this. Amherst Media, uh, we've agreed, has agreed to uh, air um, uh, our special Juneteenth program live. It'll be on channel 12. It'll start at um, four o'clock and, um, and we'll have uh, expressions about Juneteenth uh, about its history here in the area um, and, um, and its meaning. And then at 4.30, though, we will shift into a Zoom uh, discussion of a new book by a, um, a former resident of Amherst, a native who graduated from Amherst Regional High School. His name is uh, like, uh, like Petua is at the Amherst Regional High School. Yeah. This gentleman, uh, William uh, Darity Jr., attended all four years and graduated. Um, and uh, he, along with his partner, Kirsten Mullen, have written a new book called From Here to Equality, um, Black Americans and uh, repara Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. It's published by the University of North Carolina Press. And um, uh, a group of us within uh, the, the group Bridge for Unity have, uh, have read it, we've been discussing it, and we will lead a conversation uh, from 4.30 to 5.30 on this new important book. And uh, we're happy to say that we believe uh, Dr. Darity and, uh, and uh, his wife, uh, Kirsten Mullen, will join us um, in that uh, conversation on that important book. So uh, again, just really the ask here is uh, twofold. One, uh, listing you again, as a, uh, a co-sponsor, and to um, suggesting that um, uh, this idea had come up that uh, since you all will not be doing your picnic uh, event and if there's budget for it, that you might consider purchasing copies of From Here to Equality and uh, making it available to uh, members of, uh, of, of town government and, and, uh, uh, and yourselves. Um, the um, the uh, the Darity and Mullen are joining us without taking any sort of honorarium for doing so, uh, but they did ask if it would be possible that uh, the town uh, would uh, would purchase copies and and try to you know stimulate readership you know beyond just one copy at Jones Library, but mm -hmm. uh, you know get copies and and read it and discuss it. So can I just um, chime in for a second? So. We will be purchasing 22 books, I believe, if not 20, maybe it's 25. So one will go to the library, one will go to each commission member, and one will go to each counselor. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's that part. We can segue whenever on June t on uh, the plaques, which is a nice segue to this, but, uh, but I pause if there's any questions about that part. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing. I'm just wondering if this is an appropriate time for us to consider voting on if we um, would co-sponsor the event. I'm happy to hear um, a motion to be listed as a co-sponsor for the event. And I believe that that is what is being asked of us, is that uh, that we be listed as a co-sponsor, that we support it, and, and, uh, and to the extent that we promote things on uh, our web page or Facebook page or anything like that, that we uh, would promote it there as well. Uh, is there such a motion at this time? I'd like to make that motion. <laughs> I'll second um, that motion. All right. Um, 
having been uh, a motion having been made and seconded, uh, we will now call a vote. All in favor of supporting uh, the Juneteenth celebration as described. Aye. Uh, any against? <laughs> All right. Um, it looks like uh, it passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Great. Well, segueing and, and bringing in um, our uh, um, other two participants in this section, um, I first learned of the, um, the plaques when I moved here shortly after 2007. And, uh, but I'd like to just uh, yield to um, uh, Anika Lopes or Deborah Bridges to, to pick up and I can chime in a little bit on it later on. Anika, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So can you explain um, the significance of the plaques and your family's history um, about these plaques? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how uh, much history of uh, background that you all have in regards to the, um, the Civil War plaques, um, which include names uh, from soldiers from the 54th Regiment. Um, my grandfather, Dudley Bridges, had uh, first had interest in these plaques that actually came to the town. Um, well, his interest came to the town around 2000. And it wasn't until 2002 that he had approval to begin fundraising uh, to find these plaques a proper home, proper memoriam. Uh, he passed uh, before this could be completed in, in 2004. Uh, myself, I stumbled upon an article um, I'm originally uh, from Amherst. I lived in Brooklyn for decades, but when I came back, I stumbled upon an uh, article which talked about these plaques and how they were in storage. Um, so, of course, my first call was to historians, the Shabazzas, and, um, you know, learned uh, what they knew about it, talked to some of my other uh, family members who had been involved with um, the Civil War, the graves that had gone into the West Cemetery. Um, and uh, just response lately and talking with the historical committee has been, uh, people are, it seem to be excited about it. And, um, you know, we're happy to move forward. I'm extremely grateful for um, expert input and involvement, like um, Mr. Shabazz, Dr. Shabazz, who has um, more in-depth information in regards to his experience with the town um, and ceremonies that have been held. Um, but it is definitely, we are um, in works on our proposal to have these really up and moving in hopes that they're not only celebrated, it's um, actually more important maybe now than it has been in some time to get them up, but also in hopes that it will lead to other cultural art installations um, around the town to really represent the diversity of this town in addition to Emily Dickinson. So if it's okay, I'd like to hand it back to Dr. Shavaz. Real quickly, Jennifer, was the, um, were the articles shared with the commission? Yes. Okay, great. So I, I think it's mentioned in one of the articles, um, if I remember correctly, that the Bridges family, it, is it correct, Anika? Uh, you, you all go back at least five generations? Well, yes. So my, my great-grandfather was also very passionate about this. My great-grandfather was Gilbert Roberts, um, who was born, when was he born? 1896. He was born in Amherst in 1896, his father as well before him. So what's, what's important about that? And thank you. Um, that was Deborah Bridges, uh, her mother, um, that you know, this is a family, uh, uniquely an African-American family that has been here over five generations. And um, they are the embodiment of uh, local history. And so her grandfather putting in the time and effort to actually help um, preserve these plaques uh, and help restore them 
uh, is, is particularly important for the history, the, the whole history, right? And the whole story and narrative of this community. And there are few to none in terms of spaces and places that African Americans can claim historically in this town, that there's an actual space where we could go and say, you know, this, this is our contribution. Uh, certainly there are places, there's a whole neighborhood um, of, uh, you know, that was uh, populated mainly by African Americans at, at one point, um, but in terms of uh, the, the history and contributions being recognized in a very public way and shared um, with this community, there, there are none really. Um, so, you know, these plaques are monumental um, in, in several <laughs> ways. They're big, <laughs> um, but they're, they're monumental in terms of the story that they tell. And um, the Historic Commission is, um, you know, the, it's going to come before the Historic Commission to get... Um, it's been before the Historic It's been before the Historic Commission um, to get, uh, you know, try to figure out where are these plaques to go. And so we see it as a part of the story of Juneteenth. We see it as a part of celebrating and recognizing the history and contributions of African Americans within this community. And so therefore I, I and my husband um, also see it as something that the Human Rights Commission, um, uh, I feel strongly should take up in some way. And so I hope you um, will be convinced to feel the same. And as this works its way through the historic uh, uh, commission and committees and the town government in terms of where to place these, um, these monuments to um, African Americans who have sacrificed their lives uh, for this country, um, I hope that the Human Rights Commission will support it and help as the as these as the permissions uh and this discussion progresses through the town and i'll just uh, jump in to say this that um you know projects to make it through uh to completion any thing within the town needs a champion the last champion on this was uh town manager john Masanti, and uh, and he he died you know without you know, with the ball, the project, yeah, yeah, with the ball being dropped, he had, his championship was that it should go in the um, in the meeting room uh, in town hall. But uh, it was deemed that um, the 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 tablets were too heavy to uh, go in that room, and then they just stayed crated up, mothballed, and and it um, it hasn't had a champion since then to really move the dime and get things going on this. By the way, I, to not get it twisted, it is not simply the African-American soldiers on these Definitely. tablets. In 1893, the Grand Army of the Republic, a Civil War veterans organization, donated to Amherst the six large marble tablets that displayed the names of more than 300 soldiers from Amherst and surrounding Hilltown communities who had enlisted in the Union cause on, on, uh, uh, on behalf of the citizens. Uh, among these were about 21 black soldiers, uh, soldier fathers, sons, brothers, uncles, and nephews from this area who enlisted and served in the 54th. So the 21 African Americans are there, but it, it, it recognizes the contribution of all 300 plus soldiers from this area, regardless of ethnic or racial background. Uh, are, 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 are commemorated uh, for their uh, sacrifice and for their, uh, um, you know, uh, participation in that, uh, in that great, great uh, conflict. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to recognize different voices that have been a part of Amherst history uh, throughout Amherst's history. Um, you know, one of the things that that is always tricky for me is looking back at celebrations of, of lives lost. Um, and I think that's important. You know, there's, there's the counterbalancing of celebrating those um, 
who who die in battle um, as opposed to other other voices um, so uh, recognizing the heroism of war um, which is when you don't have a choice when uh, there's a draft or when you're fighting a, a just cause uh, I, I imagine that there are many people who would argue that that is the appropriate thing to do um, to celebrate those lives to the extent that um, you know, there's a habit of having, um, you know, memorials to those who have fought in wars, regardless of what side they fought on, um, you know, and, and we see this at educational institutions where you recognize uh, people who have um, participated in any conflict, uh, and particularly places that are old enough that they have people who have fought on both sides of the Civil War. And, and when they recognize both, that's, that to me is an issue. Um, and is not a good thing to do. Uh, but uh, I, I think for this one, we would need to have a little bit more knowledge on what's happening um, as it's going through the process. What would be a, a supportive way to make sure that that aspect, at least that aspect of Amherst history does not get lost um, in the process of the removal in 1997 for the cleaning, I think it was, and it was supposed to go back up and then it just didn't ever go back up. Uh, and, and there were plans that were drawn up in 2003, I think it, 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 uh, the material we've, we received said. Um, so there's definitely at least appear to have been an intent to maintain that. And uh, for whatever reason, there, the choices made by town governments between that time and now have not carried through that uh, that anticipated maintenance. So um, you know, as as it's going forward, I, I think it would be good for us to stay informed. Uh, Gazit Chaya, you had something to say. I'm just wondering, um, Dr. Shabazz, are we aware of any other families that have direct connection to any of the other 300 names mm -hmm. that may still be around in town? Um, the what I know on that is that um, there was an effort at West Cemetery some years ago to clean up all of the grave sites and to um, put little markers and flags on all of the um, uh, tombstones, all of the, the burial plots of those who had served um, and, uh, and were buried in West Cemetery. And at that time, there were a number of um, families, descendants, who, uh, who came out to that service. I met several of the families. So um, there, there is information on that, and, uh, uh, and there are people still living, um, some in the area and some outside the area. I think some of the descendants came as far as from like Virginia or somewhere to, uh, to participate in that, um, that service. There's an article about it somewhere in the, in the uh, local paper. Uh, when it was held. But yes, there were many living uh, descendants of uh, folks uh, on those, among those 300 names on the tablets that are, uh, that are in the area and, and outside the area. Thank you. I, I asked because I'm wondering if it's of use to have this not have to be held solely um, through the Bridges family. Um, and if there might be some connecting of the other families. Uh, and my other question was, is as you go through the process, you, you mentioned that you're looking, or that there's a champion that's needed, some, that there's um, a need for someone to take up this cause. And I'm wondering, is this uh, more of promoting and reinforcing the community support or is there also like financial and logistical needs? Well, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Anika. At this point, we are uh, really wanting to get the message out, awareness, um, support, interest. <laughs> there has been if, uh, a significant amount, Dudley Bridges, uh, grandfather to Anika Lopes, uh, father to Deborah. Um, he actually, at the end of his life, raised a considerable amount of money um, in conjunction with uh, his friends at the VA and within the town. 
And uh, what happened after the restoration of these plaques, from what I understand, and Nika, please correct me if I'm wrong, that they were restored, cleaned, and then shelved. So uh, they have been in storage uh, in Jones Library. And oh. I'm sorry, not Jones, the town. They're at Ruxton's um, storage oh. unit. And so they were put in, sto in temporary storage. So th there's a question of what, will they need to be restored again? Because what they were put in was only supposed to be temporarily. And it's been, that was done in, so it's been quite a, quite a long time since they've been in there. And so that, that's uh, an issue and a problem because you have these, um, these monuments that were cleaned, restored, then put into storage, and no one, you know, has figured out what to do with them, yet there is funding, there is money that's available to help erect, create a space in which to place uh, these, these tablets. So thus far, we haven't gotten anything from uh, the town manager or the historic commission to say, hey, we're against this. Um, it's simply going through the process. So they do, like Anika indicated, they um, are excited about the possibility of these going somewhere. But, you know, as, as my husband indicated, there needs to be some community support around the placement and how they are to be displayed. There is funding that was raised and the money is just sitting there. So it's not like we're asking even for the town to put forth more money. I mean, I, I don't so know. where, mm -hmm. go ahead. There's $35,000 that was um, gifted by the community CDBG, like the historical part of the CDBG committee, commission. Right. So I don't, the money that, that came from Mr. Bridges, I'm not quite sure where that is or if that was used in the original um, restoration or not. Well, I also so, note a, a news article that looks like about 14,000 was wasted at some point on some, some architectural firm to, right. to make some kind of evaluation that again, went nowhere, went, went into the trash basket. So, you know, we don't want that. We don't want more money wasted. Right. We want a champion that can help us figure this out, um, establish a good visible place uh, for this. And by the way, three members of the Dickinson family uh, are on the tablets. Um, so, you know, if there are any descendants of the Dickinsons, um, you know, they, they're, they're a part of this too. Um, now, Jennifer, you just mentioned uh, the a community development block grant uh, at some point, $35,000, but uh, uh, we're also hearing that a component of it, uh, 14000 of that at least was spent, or, or are we talking about different That's pockets, different pots of money? currently now. Currently in it, I see. Yeah, so that was voted. More. Yep, and um, the former planning director, not John Thompson, sorry, I've come to a loss in names, but he was spearheading it and then he retired. So he was starting to, to make movement on it again, but then he retired. So once again, we're back here and I saw Benjamin on who is in, works in the planning department, but it seems like he signed off. I was hoping maybe we could get some information from him as well as, but I do know that the local historic district commission is very excited to have this to start to move. So yes. We would like to keep it moving and not have it fall back again. There was questions about where to put it. So the li it doesn't necessarily work in the library and it doesn't necessarily work in town hall. I personally think the North Common, if they could figure a way to have it outside would get the most views that way. Or even across from Sweetser Park before the Emily Dickinson, there's, a, there's town property right in there. I don't know that it would get as many views as it would get if it was in the North Common but they're also redoing the North Common. So perhaps that can be tied into the plans of the reconfiguration of the North Common. Now, one of the other things I saw in, in the description of the stone itself uh, is that uh, things such as human sweat and whatever else, that, that it really does need to be taken care of. 
Uh, I don't know what that means as far as both uh, placement as well as a study for the proper preservation of uh, the, the tablets over time. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think one of the things we would like to know is, is what the um, investment that the town wants to make in recognizing that aspect of its history. Because um, from the information that we've received, there appears to be some degree of, of maintenance cost that would be required over time, particularly if it were outdoors and not kept away from where people can touch it. Uh, so that's, that's something that I, I think it would help, help us all as we're trying to figure out um, how much to push. Uh, and we also haven't heard, uh, because we haven't met since February, and we know that there's unfortunately a lot of of cuts that are going to be made, a lot of tax money that isn't going into the town um, over the last couple of months, and that there's a lot of uh, cost cutting that's gonna be happening with regard to education, uh, with regard to employment, mm -hmm. that it, it um, is a concern, um, you know, if, if we're going to promote something, we just should have some idea of, of what the, uh, if there's already funding there for it. And it sounds like there already is some funding for this project that might allow it to move forward in some fashion. I guess to boil it down to sort of, again, what the ask is here is just as a related part of, of town government um, with, uh, you know, commanding the respect of our, of our city council, of our town council members and of our town manager, just in whatever way you all might might think to make a nudge on this, a memo, a note, um, the um, I think could be very very helpful in moving it along. I've taken the liberty to discuss this with colleagues of mine in the architecture department at uh, at UMass. These people have expertise in build in materials, uh, building materials, and other kinds of materials. They have expertise on developing structures that could be put in. And I think we could even, you know, enlist, I'm looking at how to enlist them to do it in ways that could be educational for the students and, and therefore more on a pro bono basis. So I don't think we need to get caught up at this point um, in, in anything else than just trying to nudge for there to be a champion, uh, for a champion to emerge within our town administration, our town bureaucracy, so that this thing can move forward and not be left to be mothballed and, and, and die again uh, uh, since it's been brought back up. We just need all voices, I think, pushing to, uh, um, to get that champion, but you know, the site, the location, the building materials, how it's protected, we, we've got expertise around here and some that we don't even have to pay for uh, possibly that that can can figure all of those kinds of questions out. You know, one of our uh, council members uh, um, uh, is is a, a professor of architecture, chair of uh, has been the chair of the department, Schreiber. You know, I know Steve very well and can talk. To, and many of you may know him as well. And you know, we can figure this out in terms of the best place to place it, how to place it that protects it and preserves it with a low maintenance, ongoing maintenance bill, bill um, you know, and, and we've got the historians here in town that can help to develop the signage and the, to help tell the story and contextualize it for people as they stop and view it. All we have though is a uh, more than century old part of our town remembrance of this, of this great conflict and of the sacrifices made locally in it we just need the will to step out there to again create that champion to move it through the bureaucracy to to uh, um, to where it, it gets out of crates and mothballs and storage units and back into um, the the culture of our of our town. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you again. Um, I have two thoughts. I'm wondering if we could consider. Uh, it, it sounds like this may already be a thought of yours to weave it into the Juneteenth and consider uh, explicitly inviting some of the families that were invited to that West Cemetery event. Um, 
and provide opportunity for some more connecting and perhaps specifically um, invite someone from the planning, uh, from the town planning uh, department. Um, but I'm also wondering if the commission would consider writing a letter of support and weaving in some of um, acknowledgement that Matthew mentioned about, you know, the, the struggles about celebrating war, but also about acknowledging that this is something that's very absent from our community and something that is, a, is um, a, an opportunity that we ha have that doesn't actually require too much uh, financial investment, which is unique and something um, we should really take advantage of that we could share with um, the town council and the community uh, to state that um, we would support this project moving forward and then consider keeping it on our agenda as something to check back in with the progress um, on a on just an ongoing basis to keep it in uh, presence of mind. And I'll just say, I think that's exactly the type of support um, that we were looking for and also to generate interest, it would be great to know if there are other uh, family members in the community or, you know, close by, we can, you know, people can speak over the internet, that would be great. Um, is, you know, we do have, you know, quite a lot of interest in our, you know, aware of course of the time we are in this world and where, you know, money is, is needed most in some cases. So, Yes, again, we have all of those things in the works and we just are looking for and appreciative of any other support. And moving forward. So I'm, I'm not sure though if we uh, received a, a uh, if, if that was a motion um, for a, a statement and if so, um, who, we are tasking with drafting that statement in the first instance, and then whether it's coming back to us to approve the statement uh, at our next meeting. Um, if, if that's the case, I would just love to hear um, a motion and know that we have a volunteer who is uh, willing to work on uh, drafting the statement if, that we would be able to approve uh, at our next meeting. Thank you, Matthew. I that is exactly what I meant to say. And I appreciate you helping me with the language of uh, how to do these meetings. So yes, I would like to make a motion that we draft um, a letter of support and I would be happy to take that on and that we come back together the next meeting to vote on approving that. Is there a second? Second from Deb. Okay, um, so we have a, again a motion made and seconded. Uh, that just requires a vote of the commission. Uh, all those in favor? All right, any opposed? Abstentions? All right, um, uh, again, it looks like we are happy to, uh, to work on a statement and, um, and we have already a volunteer who is willing to, uh, to get us moving on it, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Um, that brings us a um, on to just a, a quick indicator of coming events. We had already listed that Juneteenth was an event that we, um, and I'm glad that those who are organizing it uh, were able to, to join us this evening because uh, we were going to plan on uh, discussing uh, that as an event that we would look to support again. Um, uh, we've also received notes from uh, those involved with uh, Citizens for Race Amity now uh, about supporting Race Amity Day. That is not going to be a, uh, an event that is being hosted within the town, uh, but instead it was just a question of whether we could notify about a statewide uh, event that's going to be happening on Zoom all, all electronically and uh, whether we could, um, to the extent that we are notifying others of events through our web pages, uh, that we would, we would do that. Uh, and I believe that's coming up in um, about two weeks, a little bit less than that. Um, so that is, and then uh, the 
third upcoming event was the reading of the Frederick Douglass speech, What to the Slave is the 4th of July. Um, so uh, Jennifer, you wanted to speak on that. Uh, we're not hearing You're you. muted. There the you. dog was barking. So um, I wanted to bring it back to Juneteenth quickly, just because I also forgot that I spoke with Cynthia Harbison from the library, and she's going to come up with a digital display of the items that she has in archives for Juneteenth. So that will okay. be that will be very nice as well. Um, and then moving to the speech now, I had spoken with Dr. Shabazz, Mr. Dr. Shabazz about the speech. And I think that there was some talk about having children read the speech. Was that, am I correct in that? That you had said Ingrid had suggested that? Yeah, that's what we're hearing. Yeah. Okay. Still looking to be doing it on a virtual level. Yeah. Yeah. With ACT, hopefully with Amherst Media. I'm sorry, I keep calling it ACTV. Yeah, so, um, yes, we hope that is yet to be arranged. We're trying to work with them on Juneteenth, so one event at a time. But most likely, it would uh, also work through Zoom and have uh, young people read different parts, which I think even you know through Zoom visually, um, that would be really exciting to have young people from the community participate. So uh, Petua will will be looking. You know, there's at least three of you all in one family. So <laughs> uh, getting you all to help read as well. So I'm also do going to. Um, a, sorry, do we have a date and time on Juneteenth? Yeah, four, June nineteenth. Four thirty. Four thirty. No, four, four o'clock. Four o'clock. Four to five thirty, and we'll be sending that out. We're trying to. Um, they have to do the Zoom connection through Amherst Media, and so we can't send the invitation out um, until they figure out how that's going to work because it's going to be live. Um, so that's why it's it's taking a little bit. Should but. be out tomorrow or the next day. Yeah, I was I was going to ask if the bell ringing ceremony was going to be taped live. Well, no, uh, they said they recommended that we tape a ringing of the bell that already occurs and they'll put it in at that time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, cause what it is, and I'm, I'm now I'm wearing my official hat, so to speak, as, as uh, president of the board of Amherst Media, you're talking about two staff members and, and Jim, the executive director. And um, that's going to be pretty difficult to coordinate cause you'd have to have one person at the station um, ready to go live with the Zoom for broadcast, and then another person taping, you know, at town hall. So that's that's just too much, really, to try to coordinate during these mm -hmm. times. And we don't have interns um, uh, right now. So, so um, yeah, we can talk about these little details a little bit more. But sure. I'm also sorry, if our <laughs> IT department can get involved in that as well. Okay, great. I think often avoiding doing things live that can be recorded in advance and that we know work uh, is not necessarily a bad thing. Exactly. So. <laughs> so the counselors will be doing a pre-recorded, each of them will take a portion of the proclamation. I'm not quite sure which ones yet, but they will take a portion of the proclamation and read it and have it recorded and they'll send it to Bree and Bree will compile it and then send it to you to AC. Amherst Media. Great. 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 Awesome. Um, okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually ask um, that we take the um, wage bylaw proposal and non-discrimination statement proposal uh, out of order and uh, bring them up before we discuss, generally speaking, uh, the leadership role of the Human Rights Commission during this challenging time and uh, health and safety, housing, employment, uh, and income issues, and equal treatment under law issues. Um, just because the wage bylaw proposal is a more specific uh, issue and, uh, and the non-discrimination statement is one that we've already heard about in great detail. And so uh, to the extent that we want to speak to that or, or act on that in any way, 
uh, I think that we would be able to do that fairly quickly. And um, and I do get concerned that the um, you know the meeting did start a um, little after six, but um, there are all these studies that suggest that Zoom um, isn't really that great for people staying on for hours and hours. So um, if we can avoid that, uh, I would I would try to do that. All right. Um, so I emailed out uh, the. Um, the wage uh, bylaw, and um, that is a proposal. It is um, something that, as I, I mentioned, uh, and I only sent that out, I think, at something like 5.30 or something like that, um, as uh, to deal with the fact that the town will sometimes uh, work with contractors. I think that in a lot of other communities, they have used uh, the wage bylaw to prevent the towns or cities themselves from hiring contractors who are stealing wages from employees um, or are uh, collecting tips together and then not distributing them to people who are doing uh, the work for which they believe they're being paid. And so the intent as I read it behind the wage bylaw proposal um, is for there to be some kind of punishment at a town level uh, in addition to reporting the uh, companies that are not making payments to the attorney general's office but also to say we're going to recognize that uh, this company has to put a bond down to make sure that they're going to be able to hire to pay the employees that they've hired uh, and to make sure that uh, individuals are not deprived of income after they've done work. Um, and I believe that in the communities that have focused on areas like the construction trade, they've looked specifically at communities that tend to be taken advantage of, um, you know, picked up to do subcontractor work um, and then end up being stiffed at the end of a work day and said, look, we need to do something where at least if there's a town contract, uh, we're not putting our money behind a company that is harming uh, individuals who would be doing that work. So um, there's very little that the Human Rights Commission itself is being asked to do in this. Um, it does require that the Human Rights Director, um, so someone working within the town and looking at human rights issues as a town employee, um, be uh, able to receive complaints about violations of a wage bylaw, uh, report that uh, to licensing bodies in town to prevent people from continuing to uh, have a license to do work within the town of Amherst if they're abusing uh, employees, and, um, and to try every two years to meet with the Attorney General's office uh, to discuss what is occurring within the town of Amherst and what we're doing to, uh, to deal with that problem. So um, take, a, take a look at it. Um, it is again something that is um, going to go before the town council at some point. And I believe the town councilors who, uh, who reached out wanted to know that it would have the support of the Human Rights Commission. I don't know that you've had enough time um, without us having met. Um, and while I would love to believe that you could all just rely on my say-so, um, I would be a little bit more comforted knowing that everyone had a chance to actually read the document and, uh, and reach their own uh, opinions on that. Jennifer. You gotta unmute yourself, Jennifer. Sorry, is this the revised draft? Uh, I sent out the draft that uh, Mandy Johanneke sent to me a couple of days ago. Um, so maybe, yeah, so the most revised draft. I believe that I, I, I'm not part of their drafting process, so I, I can't say for sure uh, what is the most revised, but this one um, limits some of the role of the Human Rights Commission um, and others in, in investigation. 
Uh, one of the things that a lot of people th think is a good idea in the first instance is that a body like ours investigate complaints um, without realizing that such an investigation would be a public uh, investigation and that uh, as a volunteer body that um, meets once a month, we aren't in a position to uh, to jump on investigations and to to work with them very quickly. Um, so that's that's uh, there have been some changes I think, uh, but they are looking to wage bylaws that have passed in other communities as the basis for the wage bylaw. And am, am I understanding correctly? They recently passed unanimously something to do with this. Am I correct? When I, I reached out to when I re reached out to my town councilor, I think it was earlier in the week, and said I'd like to um, share my support for the wage bylaw theft bill, or I'm not sure exactly its title. And my town councilor responded that we had they had voted unanimously and approved it. I had not yet heard that, um, uh, and so I, I would find it surprising for them to reach out and ask. For us to discuss it at right. this meeting if, if that vote had occurred but you know so maybe i'm misunderstanding has, maybe it was a part well it has a double prep double process so it has to go to g it goes to starts in i think they started it in gol and then it goes gol presents it to the council and it gets approved and then it goes back if there's any changes that are needed back to gol so it and could be what somewhere is, that it was approved with gol what is gol Oh, yes, governance of uh, organization and legislation. I'm sorry, they have a lot of those and I, it's. They have so, yeah, I'm just the alphabet soup there. I have May 28th about the Amherst wage theft ordinance um, from Darcy Dumont. The town services committee last week voted unanimously to support the proposed wage theft bylaws. Now the proposal has moved to governance organization and legislation committee and to review by the town attorneys. It will, then it will move to the full council for a vote, hopefully by the end of June. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think I announced back in September that uh, one of the town councilors had reached out um, over the summer and said that there was a possibility of of some kind of wage bylaw um, being looked into, and um, and I didn't receive any. Um, uh, I don't believe I received additional information up until about uh, another few weeks ago. Um, so I'm glad that it's moving forward, and it's something that people have been looking at for for a good while now. And who's the staff person that's going to be contacted, since we don't have a human rights director? So it would have been Evelyn. Evelyn is leaving, so it'll most likely go to uh, uh, Paul and or myself, yep. And what are they asking of us? Um, again, the, uh, there were two components to the Human Rights Commission's role. One was just that we could engage in, uh, in community education on, on issues of, of uh, wage theft. Right. And, uh, and the other, whenever you say two things and you know you're going to forget the second, um, the other was, um, three C and D, uh, let's see, that the, um, It was the human rights chair has to uh, compile a report, I believe, with the director, an annual it's the, report. It's the uh, town human rights director working with the human rights commission shall publish an annual report detailing the number of wage and tip theft complaints received, actions taken in response to such complaints, et cetera. So, um, and any recommendations for revision uh, to the wage and tip theft bylaw. So. Um, so that's something, you know, over time, I think the language will have to be worked out um, 
what exactly does that entail? What responsibility would we have? Uh, that might be something that gets worked out more in practice uh, than it, it can uh, by trying to do perfect wordsmithing, um, just to figure out how exactly we would want to report back um, as part of the community uh, and say, this is something that we feel needs to change. This population is really being taken advantage of, um, but that's something that could come through us, but the human rights director would be the author of the report. So given that the council is trying to vote on it by the end of June and we're not going to meet again until July, I'd like to make a motion that we go ahead and give our support. And as you said, that we let it, you know, as it comes to fruition, it will get fine tuned about what our role is, but that we have a ability to say so I also was going to ask if you guys wanted to go ahead and meet on our third Thursday or the fourth Thursday of the month. I wasn't sure if you guys wanted to or not. There's just a lot going on right now and we are down to the last half hour of our meeting and we haven't gotten all the way through the agenda and the next items up are pretty important. So I just would like to know how you guys feel about that. I mean, I, I for one, um, would be okay with, uh, would be excited about a, a check-in at the very least, um, you know, to see if there's stuff that we can be responsive to and thoughtful about uh, and help the town on. And, and I also like seeing all of you. So there's that too. Um, so I, I would be up for that. I don't know if everyone else um, feels the same way. I absolutely do. Are we talking about the 18th or the 25th? I'm okay with either one of those. I just, it's up to you guys. Can you bring them in the house, please? Well, I think if it's the 18th, then we would have one day to check in about whether there was any further needs regard, you know, for the Juneteenth. So it might be strategic for us to meet on the 18th. I'd be fine with that. Uh, okay. And I also think that that would, um, before the the academic year officially ends, I think it officially ends for the uh, Amherst Public Schools on the 18th. On the 18th, yeah. So, um, so for for people who are um, somehow connected with um, people in that system and who otherwise are going to flee um, as soon as they can uh, once things shut down, um, the 18th people might still be around. So that's-, that's Where is anyone going? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, they might retreat further into their house. <laughs> and does this time work for everyone? This time, the 6 p.m. time is good? It's possible I may have a conflict, but if everyone else can do it, I'll do my best to figure it out. Okay. I, you know, if we can, try and um, we've tried to keep these meetings to an hour and a half. Obviously there's a lot happening right now and we haven't talked about the stuff happening right now because we wanted to um, to be responsive to, to some of the requests that have come in on specific issues for events coming up. Um, so I, I think if we can do six and, um, and if we have a lot to do, um, use at least a full hour and a half. Um, if we don't, then we, we check in and, uh, and we keep on moving. All right. Um, so it seems like we're, we're good on that. Um, and that brings us back to the leadership role of the Human Rights Commission um, during this time. And uh, I put underneath that, uh, you know, health and safety, housing, employment, income, uh, and equal treatment under law. That's a lot. And one of the reasons I put all of those things down is uh, um, we are um, the part of the town that tries to make sure uh, we're working for everybody, that we're expressing the same care for all of the people who come through Amherst um, as, as anyone could possibly be treated with. 
uh, under the rules and under the, the laws of our town. And we are parts of a lot of different communities, a lot of different, um, both in Amherst, uh, nationally and globally, we're parts of a lot of different communities. And because of that, we're seeing different things um, and we're responding to different things. Um, with the COVID pandemic, I think there's a lot that, um, that different people are seeing and uh, different relationships among uh, those that we care about, um, you know, as far as, you know, Deb just mentioning quarantine uh, and the fact that people aren't going anywhere. Um, when we are, when we're outside, when we're interacting with each other, are we all being treated the same way? And, you know, the answer, unfortunately, here as elsewhere is likely no. Um, and even being in spaces, um, where not everyone feels safe and comfortable uh, being in the same space as, as family members, as partners um, over a long period of time. And there's a question of what we can do and we can't be in everyone's home. We can't, um, we can't deal with every issue that comes up. We can be aware and, uh, and try to be thoughtful of things like the discrimination that was occurring in January, February, March, uh, as some people uh, tried to treat COVID as though it came from a particular country or that people who were of particular ethnic backgrounds were more likely to be carriers than other people. Um, and I've heard less about that in Amherst than I've heard about it in a lot of other places, which is a good thing, but uh, that doesn't mean that it's not an issue. Um, for those of us who have family members who've had, uh, you know, dealings, I, I had a nephew who was flying across country and at, on a layover in Salt Lake City was arrested uh, and beaten by the police officers there. Um, that was end of April. And, you know, this is part of living in the United States today. Um, and it would be great if we as a community were able to, um, to bring our voices together and, and speak to this. I'm so glad that um, our town manager, police chief, superintendent of schools, uh, and police unions um, came together and make a statement on, uh, that I also joined for the Human Rights Commission, or I guess I joined as chair of the Human Rights Commission because I couldn't get you guys uh, together to, to vote on it. Uh, I hope you, you have read it. I hope you liked it. Um, but, you know, to, to basically say we need to do better as a community. Um, I think the Human Rights Commission has a great role in listening. Um, and so I would like to hear from you if there are voices that we um, should be listening to and amplifying during this time uh, and ways we can do that. And I will say that for myself, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I know a lot of people are. We're dealing with a lot of, of things. We're worried about a lot of different people. And, um, and strangely enough, for, for those of us who are uh, able to continue working, we continue to have deadlines. Uh, for those of us who are not able to continue working, that tires you out too. Um, it, it, it leaves you worried and, and that impacts you. So um, if there are some voices that, that you think we should be hearing and amplifying in town, I, I would love to uh, hear that now and, and have us discuss that for a few minutes to see what our role can be in, in listening to and amplifying those voices. Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I think as a young person, I think that uh, with social, like social media, especially the like hyper exposure to everything that's going on and like 
with around the country in in like Northampton and Boston are like all like how um how this is affecting like the whole country is like it's a huge moment for I think a lot all of us but I feel like especially for the youth who are often at the forefront of like movements that occur um, nationwide or internationally and all of that I think it's really important that we as a community help inform the youth and like just like guide people guide us uh, the young people to be able to um, like express their like grievances about what's going on but also like like be able to feel like they have power in their in the Amherst community to make change whether that be in their schools or in their uh in their communities at their in their home areas neighborhoods um like how or jobs too if they're working like how they can uh, uh, how to be like powerful in their youth um knowing that many movements are started by and sustained by like youth um, agents so i think that i think there's a lot of hope that comes with um events like these even with all of the revolts and everything that's like we're feeling up a lot of emotions but i feel like a lot of hope is like really um instilling in what's going on so i think that to sustain that hope and can like carry it over into like the systems that youth have to interact with all the time was really important to show not only that adults are like not just like okay not just like being like okay we see you but we're not really going to change anything because it's working for us but also like um have, have like just making sure that youth are able to be like like stakeholders in their own futures and their own education their own um, careers and stuff like that i think that that's really important and as and knowing that like uh, in america a lot of uh, black people especially specifically are being like have always been fighting for liberation um since the moment since they first arrived here involuntarily like, like they there's like um to see how youth can see themselves whether they're black or white or all like all the intersections of themselves how they can see themselves as stakeholders in their futures and learning through other um movements but also like seeing seeing change happen in their community i think is really important so i think exposing the amherst youth to those to the change that is happening in the community whether it's on the government uh level or in the in their evil and smaller communities i think is really important so yeah sharing that was really important to me especially thank you petra i'm wondering do you have um an idea about what type of an event or um uh or an effort would be something that would feel um accessible and welcoming and um affirming to youth specifically yeah i've been thinking mostly in terms of education because like right now i know that all of us are dealing with like online um schooling which is really difficult for a lot of us for various reasons whether you have like ieps or anything that like you're like people know that you have something that you need extra care for but even if it's like with me like i'm a i have I, school has always been easy for me, but even the, in the, in this time, it's been especially difficult to find the motivation to do the work that I want it, that I need to do in order to prepare for my future. And knowing, like, even with the events with like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all those people that have died for like none, no reason other than being black, that is um something that like it makes me kind of second guess the education that I am receiving, and I think that is that. I think that's sh that's being shared more often on social media. So I think that, especially when thinking about the leadership administration in schools, like thinking about how either to affirm to students that their education that they're receiving now is important, but also like taking a look at what the education they are receiving and how that's preparing them for the world that they're entering or they see every day. I think that there needs to be a collaboration between um, leadership in education and the youth and also um, just I think social media is a really good fa like tool especially with youth all the time like Instagram you get those posts all the time Snapchat you have discussions all the time and it's it's it has their positives and negatives but like 
having an event where um, students can like just share their experiences in the community. And these can be like even people who have graduated from the high school and like have their own experiences so we should like so we can know what our school is like what our school can be too i think that would be really great um and then also like the transparency with the administration how how like what exactly are they implementing to combat the white supremacist like structures that are in educational systems across america like specifically amherst i think that transparency is really important so i think transparency with the leadership is important and then conversations among the youth um that are guided by like the human rights commission like wanting us to share our voices what whether we do it like with the artistic approach or videos or like if you want to do something sports like using your own talents to express how you're feeling what i think is really important um so yeah that would be cool well, I, I want to pose a question, and, and this is to everyone. Um, in this time period where people aren't together, um, you know, obviously there's the ability on Zoom for those people who are controlling this to um, be in breakout spaces, breakout rooms, um, and there's a, a chance for people to talk with each other. I think one of the things that we lose and we have, um, you know, people who've graduated from the high school in the last couple of years who are now looking at a broader world all the way down to people who are uh, younger who just want to express what it means to, to them to see things that are um, either frighteningly new and disturbing or frighteningly not new and disturbing. You know, um, but I, I just noticed, Ben, that you also had, had your hand up, you were gonna speak. Yeah, so, so the question posed, like, what voices need to be amplified in Amherst, in the Valley, in general? So, so I was part of this men of color conversation yesterday within the school district. And yes, we were talking to the men of color who are in positions of leadership within the, the district. But the voices that don't get heard here in the Valley, like the, the, I guess there's a frequency situation here going on where there's, there's this deafness to this certain frequency. Black voices, African-American black voices. Specifically, we don't hear a lot from, from young black men out here about what they're going through. And yet when I drive through town, those are the ones that I see that are dealing with the, the, these situations. Yes, they affect other people, but it's different when you're looking at like, like a George Floyd situation and you see that Oh wow, that's the same. I'm the same target as that person. Those are the voices that fall by the wayside consistently throughout the valley, and specifically in Amherst. And then all of the the black voices in general. But I'm saying like there was that there there because there was like a general sense. I mean, there it was well attended yesterday, right? Online and socially distant, but very well attended. And there was the 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 consensus there. You know, not one person disagreed with that point right there and, and so so action right so you have you have the cause and then there's the action what we had started to discuss was the idea of having like forums like the 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 first the first one that i was that i'm willing to put together and participate and i guess i, I would welcome the commission and other folks but around father's day we're going to do like a but it's, it's going to be a discussion between black fathers and black sons, not necessarily between me and my son, but, you know, getting a whole bunch of folks together that, that don't feel like they're heard, that need to feel like they're, that they're being affirmed, you know? So that's, that's my soapbox moment. Thank you, Ben. I, I think the idea of forums is, could be very powerful. I did want to just mention, Matthew, that from my experience in with another committee, uh, breakout rooms do not allow for um, open meeting law to be upheld. Uh, and so there has been um, some difficulty with allowing for that technology to be used. Um, but I, I think that um, to speak to both Petua and Ben, the, the opportunity to specifically create 
a time set aside that's not in this formalistic uh, come in and make a public comment only type of a model to allow for something more informal for people to come together and speak to their experiences um, could be uh, really worth considering. And then there's the other piece of that oftentimes these stories of experiences of being um, profiled or uh, targeted in a biased way in our community are experienced by um, individuals who are particularly vulnerable and um, we would be exposing them in a public format possibly. So there's the confidentiality piece and how do we provide um, a mechanism for people to um, not uh, further their vulnerabilities by sharing with us. And I think that's something that we've been talking about since the retreat, that uh, we don't have a effective way to receive complaints and to further them on um, that doesn't jeopardize someone. Um, so I think. So let me, oh, I just want to, can I, I just want to respond really quickly um, to the, I, I may have misspoken earlier when I was suggesting um, that I know that on Zoom you can do breakout rooms. It was a question of if you were trying to get um, allow for young people um, or for, for others who's, who need to hear from each other and express things to each other um, in order to kind of figure out um, what they should be discussing or, or what we as a community should be discussing. Um, it would be making a proposal to um, the, the school district or to another entity to create that space to do it. Um, we don't control this technology and so on. And, and as far as making sure that people's voices are heard, one concern I had was um, that if you have a thousand people, um, you know, on a, on a Zoom call, I don't think that's possible, but I don't know anything about technology. But if you had a few hundred people on a Zoom call and uh, someone was trying to speak and you, they can't be heard, um, or, or you've got at any point like 250 people, even if 50 people get to speak who are just sitting there and they're only listening. So if we could do something that would give everyone a chance to kind of articulate um, something and then bring it back. Uh, but, but that would be one way of, of trying to hear the voices that are out there before going to the next step of figuring out how do we amplify that voice. And I didn't mean to cut you off, Ben, um, when you were saying something. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, like I was kind of speaking in the same vein. And like the, the forums I was talking about were for the people we're talking about. So it would be just with those folks. And like, if we collectively felt the need to report back to someone, we would do that. But, but like, like my thought was having, uh, like sponsoring those things and having like safe, I, I hate the term safe space, but having spaces for those conversations, you know what I mean? That, that's kind of what I was thinking less facilitating than just saying. And so I just wanted to comment on the Zoom statement. So in a form like this, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, open meeting laws though and such. So those wouldn't apply to this, but, and then another angle, I still feel like the town itself needs to come out a little bit. And so I'm going to be working with um, Paul to see what it is that, what that might look like. and and how we can do something. And then again, as of the Human Rights Commission, I'm hosting this meeting. So th really the way if you have a big crowd that you wanna do it is you wanna have people type in their questions so that you can kind of scroll through because we've had a few meetings that people have said some stuff that just probably shouldn't have been said in a live meeting setting. So you can kind of field those questions as well sometimes. But I. I'm thinking that there should be a series of forums because there's so much to this, right? There's an educational piece that needs to be considered too, as well, because there are people in the community that just don't quite understand and get it. And, and maybe we can't get them, but if we make that attempt to say, hey, this is our way of trying to educate you, if it, you know, this is what we're gonna do, then that at least we know we've tried, right? So I kind of feel like there's that piece of that from the town that, that needs to happen whether that be us in conjunction or not. Um, 
and also the social media and I know Romy I'm gonna is it okay if we if I put you as a user tomorrow for the Facebook so we can get that going please and, do that I would love that Jennifer <laughs> and then maybe we can get some um, like the different events that can be shared on Facebook and we can put it through our feed too and then we can all share it out if we have access to Facebook if we use Facebook I did attend the the uh, protest on the common it was great there were a few people who I mean there's a lot of room there not everybody was social distancing but there was a good thousand people there so there are people who do want to be involved and do want to do something we need to come up with lots of creative ways to kind of move that forward and I think a series of different forums for young versus old and or young and old that's the basketball thing so um <laughs> and just you know, have it all kind of come together would be really fantastic. So who would we ask to, uh, to engage in that kind of forum creation, right? We can make the proposal that there needs to be uh, an opportunity for different voices to communicate and, and to be heard, but um, who then controls this space within which people can talk with each other, deal with each other, especially when most of the people I know um, growing up in community organizations, we did things by coming together. We did things by seeing each other and by creating a, that sense of community. That can't really happen now, just in this pandemic, the way that it typically has happened and we would typically expect it to happen. Uh, Deborah, you've been uh, waiting to speak, I apologize. No worries. Um, yeah, I just felt uh, so moved when, um, Petua, when you were speaking, because my daughter, I think, is in your class. And I was thinking about the just the flooding of social media images. And at the very time when you're needing the most support and the most to connect with your peers, to be able to process what's happening and understand like how you respond and, you know, the whole questioning of like, why am I even in school anyway? And, you know, all of that questioning that, that young people are, are doing right now. And at the very time that you need to be with your peers, you can, it is so hard. And um, so I just, I love this idea of a series of, um, of online forums. And then Gazit Haya, I was really thinking when you were saying that, um, online, it kind of exposes people in terms of confidentiality, but also in terms of trauma. These discussions are can be very traumatizing for a lot of people, and so, um, at least for some of some of the different cohorts that we decide are going to be important to amplify and provide safe space for, sorry, Ben, safe space for people to come together and share their experiences and and get support from each other and learn from each other that we we probably want a really um, strong and seasoned moderator to hold that space for people. Yeah, just to speak to the concern about the idea of safe space, I've, I've found it helpful to hear people describe um, seeking to create a braver space because we really don't know what is going to be experienced as safe to individuals. So. I just right, mean, and, and safety can like protect you from confronting the hard issues sometimes too. So sometimes the opposite of what we need is the safe space. We need a brave space, right? <laughs> I just need to say that this meeting is gonna end, Zoom is gonna cut us out at eight o'clock regardless. <laughs> um, so we kind of need to wrap it up a little bit. So we I just can make saw sure Romy's we get our, our official closeout. And then it's like, yeah, so we definitely need to meet on the 18th. And I think I'll try and post this meeting a little earlier so we can kind of see if more people, like for the first time we had a few people that were um, in here. We had, there were about five people just attending that, including the Shabazzes and Anika and her mother. So that's really nice. That is one of the plus sizes about them being on Zoom is more people are involved yet, Romy? Unmute, unmute. unmute. Sorry, I have an agenda item. And if we only have four minutes left, I would really like the opportunity to speak. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so there were extra attendees here because I actually did oh. some outreach um, to get people to come to this meeting because I was online asking for 
um, asking the Amherst community to have it sent to other members of the community what what we're thinking people would like to see, what, what people want. Um, and I have a lot of responses and, um, you know, some people have taken the time out of their evening to to come and see us and be part of this conversation. Um, I don't know how you guys want to put this back on the agenda item, but these people uh, who you saw this evening showed up to see that conversation um, about what we can do for our community. Um, so I would really like us to take a little bit of time to figure out when we can have that conversation for them again. Uh, Romy, if you could just clarify. Um, so if you're talking about um, what the Human Rights Commission's uh, role can be in, in bringing people together, because I, I think uh, one of the things that I was pointing out when I said that, um, that we don't control Zoom, part of it was that we, we are a town entity and, and we are reliant on the town uh, giving us a little bit of space for us to, to meet even. Um, let alone to uh, to have a brave conversation about issues that that need to be discussed. Um, I'm glad that we were able to um, have start a conversation this evening. Um, and so I'm I'm trying to figure out other than coming back in in two weeks and saying what what have we done. One of the first questions that that I posed with regard to that was who who do we get in the town to um, to kind of begin arranging these conversations that are important. I'm glad to hear that uh, I think some people are starting to do that. Um, but if I keep speaking, you don't get a chance to respond, so. Well, apparently we're gonna be cut off in a minute. Yes, that is what I mean. Um, and this is a time sensitive issue. People want wanted to hear from us and wanted to see leadership from us. Um, that's why I specifically put a agenda item for the next 30 days, which you push back, thank you. Uh, and I, I don't quite know what we're doing here if we're not here to listen to people when they, when they bring things to us. All right, um, yeah, I didn't control the, the Zoom and, and the, the no. cutoff and, right? and I certainly Nobody don't Nobody raised to... their hand to speak. I don't have any, I can see everybody, I'm hosting the meeting. I, I have if... emails, I have emails and uh, messages. So you um, should share those with us though. Are we not Other than, I mean, like if you email them to us tomorrow so that we can have them. I mean, that's all kind of part of what this meeting was so that we can kind of figure out what it is that, and where our leadership I, is. I understand what you told us was that at eight o'clock we were about to get cut off well, and we had our agenda rearranged um, and we have, we've now gone to eight o'clock. So are we, are we ending this evening or are we not? I mean, I don't know if we can keep going. We can. I just assumed I put six to eight and I just assumed then the meeting would be done. So if we can keep going, keep going. In my experience, it doesn't necessarily stop. Okay. So we can keep oh, going. I thought it's, you put a timer on it, Jennifer, and I was like, yeah. "Well, there's wow. some. There are some Zoom accounts that are timed and will cut you off." Right, but somebody will get a signal that says you have ten minutes left. So yeah. that's what we really need yeah. to look for. So. But yeah. we could. We could also. You could share those emails, and we could add this as the first agenda item for the next meeting. Would that? Would that work? No, I think I need to resign and um, I need to do uh, outside work from our group. Um, Paul and Matt, I will send you that as an official letter. Thank you so much. Have a great Okay, well, I'm certainly sorry to hear that, especially because okay. um, as I was just asking, you know, the question is, who do we communicate with so that people's voices can be heard? Who do we speak with so that the space is created? Because we need to do that. And for, you know, those of us who are taking care of or, or trying to take care of um, older parents during this time period who are looking at, um, at trying to be responsive to news cycles that are, are incredibly difficult and are trying to maintain employment at a time when a lot of people aren't keeping it. Um, 
you know, it's a hard time for everybody. And so trying to create the space so that um, we know which of these um, items we can, we can hit on and we can move forward with and that we can partner with um, people in, uh, in the administration of the town to say, look, we understand that we may have missed some voices. I think that that's what our, our role is. Our role as the Human Rights Commission is to say, if there are, are people in the town whose voices aren't being heard in a way that it is hurting them every day, and we can do something about that, that's where we're able to step in. That's where we're able to try to create the space, but we don't have the power or the budget or, or to just make the space. We have the ability to recognize that um, people need advocates and, uh, and they need people who can hear them. And so that's what I'm hoping we can do, Desi Tahaya. Just real quickly, I'm wondering on that, um, you know, one of the sort of uh, differences about putting on a Zoom meeting versus an event where we would want to have food and, you know, um, space and some other things that are more financially um, an investment. I wonder if we could consider um, asking the town if the HRC can sponsor um, a few Zoom opportunities um, for forums and, and start us off um, and, you know, create some community listening sessions um, that would not be a financial investment at this point. Um, from what I understand, the town, you know, has the Zoom account um, and it would, you know, it, it could grow into something down the line when we have, you know, physical uh, ability to be physically together. Um, and I imagine we could, similarly to what we've done for other events, you know, enlist the support and sponsorship and collaboration of other organizations. But um, it, it seems like something that perhaps the HRC could consider doing um, some, you know, similar to bringing a table to a community event, have a, a Zoom tabling of a community opportunity. Depth. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that's what we were talking about. I think that is a great idea um, to structure a series of Zoom events. And um, I also, I don't know if any of you caught the um, President Obama's town hall yesterday. Um, and there were a number of organizations uh, represented um, in the discussions. And you guys may have heard of this, the eight can't wait proposals. Do you guys know those proposals for police? And it made me wonder, like, I have not never sat down with the police, uh, like the chief of police or the police in this town to just ask, like, you know, have they already um, instituted these eight, these specific eight measures that data shows um, really re do reduce um, uh, violent interactions between police officers and community members. Um, so I thought that that like there, there are a lot of great organizations already doing very fine work and we could piggyback on that work um, and host some kind of discussion with the police. And this might be redundant because maybe some of these discussions have already taken place. But and then, we're, you know, if we were to do that, then also report back on that to the community. Um, because I mean, that's really sort of like the big and that's one of many right of the big inflamed issues at this time. So it feels like it would be important to take action specifically on that, in addition to multiple forums. Right, and I believe Gazit Haya was going to um, meet as an individual um, uh, and and was looking for if, if there's uh, information that others are, are able to share with her. Um, I, I don't ask you to do this as, um, as the commission, but I do ask you as individuals to share uh, information that you have that, that you think uh, would be helpful. And um, even though I'm asking that everyone act in an individual capacity, once you've acted in that individual capacity, if you have information you want to bring back to all of us that we can all think about and act on, um, I think that that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, that is in the works. And um, 
the Shabazzas are going to be joining me in that. Um, and I think the, sorry, I just jumped because my cat just bit me. I have missed dinner time. <laughs> um, so uh, I think the concept of a down town hall um, is, uh, I think, could be a great first start um, if the HRC was able to uh, host a, um, a town hall through the, the lens of hearing what's going on for people, both in light of the pandemic and um, the uh, police brutality that's been uh, more highlighted uh, in the national media now, even though it's not necessarily increased. Um, uh, and also, um, Dr. Shabazz did share that um, the Bridges for Unity organization that um, they're a part of would be willing to co-sponsor um, such a town hall. Well, one question I would have is, um, and, and again, I know that Zoom is not a great thing to keep people on forever, but um, one question I would have is um, making sure we can how do we make sure we can bring in the people who have the best answers? I mean, one of the things about um, this town is that there's a number of people who will try to uh, respond to questions, answer questions. Um, some are, are better able to articulate those responses than others. But, um, you know, I, I think one of the things we've done over the past few years is we've tried to bring in uh, people from the town so we have a better understanding of what they do so that we can, when we hear questions, when we hear complaints, we know who to reach out to. Um, because again, uh, where we're the commission, we can receive complaints of someone who has um, violated someone's rights, but we aren't in a position to kind of just make rights a little bit better every day, whereas there are people who do try every day and if we can help them uh, do that and make sure that they're hearing the voices um, that, that we're trying to amplify, that's going to help more people than, um, than us being an intermediary uh, in the first instance. But I, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do that. I know that the town council is specifically looking for feedback from the community about what the community wants. Um, and I had, um, I was at the town council meeting this week and um, there and mentioned that, you know, if there could be an agenda on the next town uh, council meeting for community members to present um, some specific policies or actions that they'd like to see um, the town council take. And I think it, it would be wonderful if we could ask the town councilors um, if they would be willing to attend. Uh, and I think a, a listening session could be possibly more powerful than something like a town hall so that it's really clear that the, the opportunity is not for the town to tell the community members what they're doing, but it's for the town to hear um, and, and not necessarily even be ready with responses or um, actions, but just to sometimes being heard is um, one of the most powerful first steps. Um, so I, I wonder, um, Ben, with what you've been um, experiencing with the forum that you mentioned, how this is sounding to you. I mean, so it's along the same thing, yeah. And, and there's uh, there are definitely willing participants to come out and, and be heard, I'll say. Would it be helpful if we had something on the website where people could complete online? I don't know if that's helpful or not. But it's always good to have an idea system somewhere where folks can write down their interests and what they would like. Yeah, but we want it to be real. We want, no, we want when people put something in. No, no, I'm not suggesting that you're, you, you are arguing for something that wouldn't be real. I'm just saying we want to have some notion of how that would actually hear hear those voices if if we create something and we get um like a a, a series of of emails and we're not sure um exactly what they are mean to articulate then it puts us in a position where 
people feel like they've told us this is the issue. And we feel like we don't know what you're talking about. We don't know the issue. And so ideally it would be again, a, a kind of face to face thing where you can see people be with people understand. All right, I'm trying to respond, but I see frustration in your eyes. That's a problem. Let me try to hear you again. Um, it's hard to do that over this kind of technology in the first instance, but it's even harder if we have a, a separate space where put it somewhere and then we'll, we'll get it later and we'll look at it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer to this um, um, or right now an answer. I, I'm, I believe that um, as a group, we probably have more that we can think through and other resources that we can reach out to. Um, I also really like the idea, though, um, that it's not like an either or like listening sessions or a, a larger town hall, as well as smaller forums that happen online for like a forum for young people, a forum for fathers and sons, um, you know, that we have like group specific for a series of group specific forums, maybe leading up to a larger listening session. So people are connecting with each other where they have not maybe been able to connect because of the quarantine, the lockdown. They're connecting um, and receiving support, building towards a more community-wide kind of forum or listening or series of listening sessions in different sections of the, of, of Amherst, South Amherst, North Amherst, East, what, you know what I mean? That kind of a thing, the different districts. Um, that I, I just like the idea of it not being an either or, large or small, but both. And, and, and like a series yes. um, could yes. be, and, and, and I think, you know, we have identified as a commission that anti-racism work and, and addressing racial injustice was our mission of this year. And there's, there's to my knowledge, not been a town-wide opportunity to discuss um, racial justice. And I think that could be, you know, we could say we'd like to have an opportunity to discuss racial justice in our town in light of our history and our current events and um, either have like a kickoff, you know, event and then a series of small forums or start with, you know, I think the the structure of it is probably less, um, you know, that's something we could work out, but I think that could be very powerful to just specifically address um, what we have stated is our our goal for this year um, in a way that explicitly um, asks for community member participation. Petra, so, I'm curious what you're mm -hmm. thinking. <laughs> I, I think that it's important uh, I think to know like what the goal of these forums are, especially when like discussing how the act, like just like think like what for whoever the forums are for, like what is the point of the forum if it doesn't like help those who are impacted, um, like figure out what they need to do in their community. Like I, I feel like I am afraid that the forums will be just a way of like us being like saying like we're doing something but it's not creating substantial change in our I, I I think I just I'm just not sure what the goal is and even when thinking about our our mission for this year's of anti-racism I'm really um confused about what our role should be and like how how, how we are reaching out to communities and how we are impacting using our, our role as human rights commissioners to um, bring about the anti-racism that we believe in uh, or and I don't, I'm not even sure we all agree about what we believe like I feel like there's so much work that we, we have to do personally to understand what we're trying to do um, before we start like imposing discussions but at the same time like um, there's like what's happening right now is happening right now we must like like take um, some type of role in that. I, I, I just, I'm, I feel a little bit lost right now, but I think um, forums are great. I think a great way of like just getting to hear other voices. So I just, I just want to be clear about what the goal of the forums would be. I think. 
Yeah. Thanks, Petra. I think you, you make a ton of sense. And I think there's a common question of like, what are we actually doing? And are we making a specific change that will impact the situation rather than just talking about it? I guess as yeah. part of the planning process, I want to, hi Kitty, um, just sort of say that in my experience of doing things like this, there's sort of different kinds of forums. And I think there's like um, open forums where, you know, anybody can come, anybody can say anything, um, everybody can listen to everybody. And then closed forums, which to me are a very different kind of space. Like what you were talking about, Ben, is more of a closed forum for people who um, need to talk with other people who really understand their experience. And I feel like Petua, that's what you were talking about also to some extent. And I, I don't know how to balance those different needs, those different kinds of spaces. If we had a whole different situation, I would say, you know, let's help people organize some closed forums first where they can talk with the folks they really need to talk with and then kind of see what comes out of that and bring that into a more open forum where everybody could learn. But I think to just put everyone into an open forum just shuts, shuts voices down because it's not safe. It's never going to be safe. I mean, it's never going to be safe, but it's specifically unsafe. So I don't know. And since I'm rolling off at the end of the month, I promise I will attend things, <laughs> <laughs> but I won't be planning them anymore. But that's oh, my thought. The, Dr. Shabazz has a, his hand raised. Would okay. you like to, I, I don't know if it's Mr. or Mrs. So. So no. am I here? Yeah. Yes, you are. Okay. Just giving you on, as I mentioned to Gazette about Bridge for Unity. So we've, we're have we about a two year old group that um, has really been working on developing uh, intergroup dialogue as a, as a process, as a methodology. We have some very well-trained people who are a part of it, such as Paula Green, the founder of the Karuna Center for, for, uh, for Peace. Um, there are other people on there as well. My wife um, from uh, her work at UMass and beyond, you know, with intergroup dialogue. Uh, there are others on the campus uh, as well who are really experts at intergroup dialogue. So there, again, I just, I just chime in to say there's a lot of expertise available to you as a college town to help sort of facilitate um, a town hall that can be, can be meaningful, that can provide people the opportunity to, uh, to, 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 to express themselves, to ventilate, to share their concerns. Um, and to my knowledge, we don't have anything like that going on in the town of Amherst. So, um, you know, until COVID is lifted and we can do face-to-face -face things, I think Zoom uh, gives us the uh, a tool uh, and we have expertise through Bridge for Unity, through UMass, through uh, uh, other uh, uh, Hampshire College, whatever. Uh, we have expertise here that could really work with you to facilitate um, uh, a meaningful kind of town hall. I, I speak at this too, I'll close with this. Having gone out to this impromptu um, event by the town commons that brought out, you know, a few hundred people, I don't know. And um, there was a lot of emotion and there was a lot of feelings and need to express and, uh, and to show solidarity and so on that, you know, people were out there, Latinx people were out there, uh, um, non-Hispanic uh, white people were out there, Asian people were out there. Um, I really heard of it because the first folks calling it were the Peace Pagoda, the New England Peace Pagoda folks up at, at Leverett. Sister Claire called me, and so I knew about it from that, but then it seems like simultaneously some young people jumped out and kind of flash mobbed something on social media, and then, you know, it was this huge thing with the, with the Peace Pagoda people doing their chanting uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, the crowd doing slogans out in the street. It was really quite 
uh, uh, democratic, quite cacophonous and, uh, and wonderful. But I think uh, that's one thing, but a town hall is something else. And, and, um, and, and it could be a great thing for the town. And I think the HRC could be a great entity to lead out in, in just, you know, in, in, uh, in sponsoring that. And like I said, this expertise is here to do breakout sessions within Zoom, to do different things, to kind of moderate the flow of it. But um, if you think it's help, it would be helpful to our town in terms of preserving our culture of human rights, our culture of respect of each other, uh, and turning to each other rather than against each other, then then maybe it's something uh, that could be could be useful. I think to add on to that, I think that's a great. I know there's a lot of expertise knowing that we live in a five college area. Also knowing that we like this town has a history of upholding um, human rights uh, mindsets what, from whether you're young or old, I think that's really important. So I think that like having the right leaders um, or facilitators more, I think is a better word, um, having the right facilitators um, lead these discussions um, can really be helpful in trying to um, uplift the voices of my, like the diversity of Amherst. And I think that's important that we make sure that those, um, the facilitators are intentional in the discussions that we are having and so speaking of that, I think that with with my experience with youth, because I am a young person, um, I think that there are a lots of groups in our school that in high school and also in the middle school and younger um, students, they all, they all, when there's like a protest, like the most I've seen protest um, posts for Springfield and Chicopee and Holyoke and in Amherst and Northampton, all over the place, just posts that come out. So you know where to be every, like every day of the week. I think that the youth are really good at spreading the message and like showing up um, where they want to show their support, which is all, all over the place, everywhere. They want to show support, which I think is really important. So I think there are a lot of youth um, leaders that we need to tap into too. And I think that, I think that there should be um, closed forms first, um, led by um, respectable and um, trust, were the, um, I think, more trustworthy you, um, facilitators. Yeah, so I'm just saying, I forgot that. She's part yeah, of so Shabab, Shabab, you're still un unmuted. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, just saying, I remember Petua, Petua spoke so beautifully at Juneteenth last year. I just was uh, remembering, you know, it's, I'm reminded of, I think, from the Bible, the youth shall lead them, but thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so just getting the right leaders to get to lead these discussions is, I think, really important. And I think what Dr. Sh Mr. Dr. Shabazz is um, saying is um, that um, there's a lot of people out there that can help us. And I think our role as the Human Rights Commission should be a place where people can feel trusted to come to no matter who they are, which is, I think, really important for our mission. Um, so I think that's a good idea. I think we should start. Um, with closed forms, though, first. That's my idea. Um, so um, that goes back to the question then of if there are um, entities that reach out to young people, um, so through our schools. Right now, we know this week uh, the plan for the schools uh, is to allow for people to speak to counselors, to speak to the family center, to speak to a lot of people who can be helpful. Um, and that was a plan that was just developed this past week. Um, you know, one of the things that is a little bit tricky is we can't, um, these larger entities don't move on a dime uh, and we therefore need to come up with something that can be done over a period of time um, and, and get their buy-in, especially if they already have a connection to a population um, that, that should be having uh, perhaps that small forum um, talk where it's to each other before it broadens out. And so that goes back to my question of who do we, um, who do we partner with right now and say, we think this is an important time. We think that you are uh, able to reach uh, people who need to be heard and who need to kind of figure out um, a way forward 
in such a way that that information will get back to people who can act on it. Um, and so that, that means, for example, um, not, none of us are perfect. Um, and there are police officers who have made mistakes and continue to make mistakes in Amherst. There are also, um, you know, I'm, I'm told that there was uh, an officer last Saturday who, you know, as people are yelling, is just walking around, giving water, giving Gatorade, trying to kind of say, look, but we're here to support you and we are here to serve you. You're protesting police, I get it. You're protesting a horrible, horrible situation. And that's a horrible situation. You have every right to protest. And we want to let you know that we are still here to serve this community. So, um, you know, how do we make sure that those uh, voices that are protesting are heard by the people who say, look, I want to respond to that. And believe me that I have, um, I'm trying to act in good faith. I'm trying to do something better. And, um, and as you just said, Petra, that people should feel like no matter who you are, you can come to us. That sometimes means that, that people who are in positions of authority who um, you know, may have uh, people under their, their authority who aren't always doing the right thing, they might wanna come and say, well, look, how do we get to be part of that conversation? So um, the question for me is, how do we both make sure that there's a space where people can talk to each other in smaller groups and then get that message across somewhat quickly so that people who work in the town of Amherst and who want to serve everyone in the town of Amherst are able to do so. I'm, I'm wondering if just in light of the time, sure. um, if I could make a motion that we put on the agenda for our next meeting, an opportunity to um, really talk about logistics and strategy um, and commit to coming up with a way to move this forward, this idea that we're discussing. And I'd like to um, consider if uh, someone from Bridges for Unity would um, come to the next meeting and participate with us in that discussion. That, that sounds great to me. I'm, just, um, I'm not sure if the um, doctor and Dr. Shabazz um, had heard that. I unmuted, well, so they should be able to and, hear. And they should be able to, to um, regardless, um, everyone should feel comfortable reaching out and inviting uh, others. To yes. And... Did you, Dr. Shabazz? Yes. Yes. So, yeah, had... so um, we, we can reach out to Bridge for Unity. We're actually having our own coming together across three states on Zoom this um, this week at, uh, that will discuss the, the current events and, and what's going on. So that'll be between Kentucky, um, South Carolina, and uh, here in Massachusetts. And so we will uh, facilitate our own kind of discussion because we've kind of trained one another. So anyone, doesn't have to be the Shabazzes, it could be Paula, but if y'all are interested in just, you know, learning more about what we do, and having that as a possibility for facilitation with whatever group in whatever form, then we can invite someone from there, most certainly, or you can, you can reach out to Paula yourself. Um, okay, I, and thank I you, Dr. Shabazz. We're, we're going to be losing, um, uh, again, everyone might still be in the area, um, but we're gonna be losing the infrastructure of the school system in a couple of weeks as well. Um, and so by the time we meet again, that, that aspect of the infrastructure, I, I don't know that it necessarily entirely goes away, but um, the, the ability to um, partner and utilize that to reach out to a broad array of young people who are connected with the school system, that aspect goes away a bit. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Um, but there's very little we can do about the fact that, um, that you know, it made sense to try to determine what essential aspects of town government were in order to kind of keep the lights on uh, back in March. Um, I, I wish that we had been uh, considered 
uh, essential in, in kind of that way, uh, given how disparate, uh, disparately people are affected uh, by things as decisions are made. Um, although I will say with all the other things I've had going on, I have not been attending town council meetings. I have not been uh, you know, attending every meeting that the, that the town has because there's a lot of other stuff happening too. Um, but I, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and for uh, trying to think through what our next steps can be and who we can partner with uh, and, and who we can support. And I, I think that we have some other things to think about in the next two week period before we meet up again. Um, but there are things that give me confidence that we can move something forward and we can be part of uh, finding solutions to um, some of the unease, if not solutions to the overarching problems um, right now. I just want to double check. So um, it, I made that motion that we put this on the agenda for our next meeting and that we invite you don't need to, for you. Yeah, I, as, as I said, um, uh, I, we can put that on the agenda. You don't need to move to put that on the agenda. That's, we're all good. Just, just <laughs> tell me it's on the, um, you want to have that on the agenda. Um, it, when we send out the agenda in advance and say, are we missing anything? If it's not there, say you're missing this. Uh, and, and it gets on there. That's it. It's, Thank it's you. That you know, easy. it's beyond me what we have to motion and what we don't have to motion. <laughs> I'm like, this, this, this. Doctor and Dr. Shabazz, do you have your hand up again or is that from previous? Oh, sorry. That was from previous. Okay. All sorry. Right, perfect. No, that's fine. Perfect. So, and also any ideas, send them in and the, or share them out to the group, right? So it's not really helpful if somebody has this world of information and then we don't all know about it. So whatever ideas that you have that you want to share or thoughts of what we can do so we can kind of get the ball rolling. You know, there is a concern that, you know, we don't meet again for another two weeks. And then if we don't have a plan then, then we don't meet another again for another month or two weeks. So we kind of have to simultaneously make, try to make this happen or get to a certain point by the time we meet again. Right, because otherwise we're going to be in like July or August before we get anything going. Well, and and I'd also just point out that all of you are um, serving on the Human Rights Commission because you are phenomenal people who are already engaged and want to be engaged in the community. This should not stop you from being those phenomenal people. Be be who you are and uh and continue to work with others if you can bring some of that back to us and let us reflect some of the shine that is you we are happy with that um but if if you are shining on your own too that's fantastic keep doing that keep being you all right um so we're meeting in two weeks thank you everybody Sorry to keep you on for two and a half hours, but, um, but we will see you soon. Think about, um, about what you want those next steps to look like and think about uh, people you want to be plugged into that. And so we can do talk we need it. a motion to adjourn? We do need a motion to adjourn. Before you do that, I just wanted to throw out Petua, <laughs> if you'd be willing to just gather ideas from your, your peers um, and, and shoot those out in email too. That, that'd be yeah, so that's, awesome. yeah, yeah, that was my plan for the next steps, just Thank reaching you. out to the youth and also reaching out to the administrators. Thank you. Thank you for everything you shared tonight. I really appreciate your perspective. So the only thing we can't do is we can't talk about something that we need to make a decision on um, in order to kind of deliberate. Uh, if you have things that you want uh, to put on the agenda and you want to give us information on why uh, that should be on the agenda, you can do that. Uh, and you can share that with everybody. What you cannot do is say, this is something we need to be thinking about. And this is something, um, and I want to hear your thoughts. Let, um, you know, please respond. Because then, then we're in a meeting. And that's something that the open meeting law doesn't allow for. But otherwise, um, please feel free to share the information that you have. Uh, and be and supportive of each other. If there's stuff that you guys need to somehow informally talk about or whatever if you reply or respond or send the email to me if each individual does that then that avoids the open meeting law 
right? I'm so not that's looking how we to came avoid the open meeting law um, for the, the record. Um, oh, yes, right. We're not trying to avoid it, but it's just in compliance with the open meeting law. Is that it's better in language? compliance with the open meeting law? But <laughs> I'm, again, we like we're not going to meet for another two weeks and there's a lot to be done and we have to get it done without meeting some of that, some, most of it. So again, but, but we don't, it's not the commission necessarily getting it done. It's individuals in the town of Amherst that happen to be involved and engaged. And, uh, and I appreciate that. And if, if you share things with people who are individuals in the town of Amherst and say, here's a way you can get engaged right now, you can do that as long as it's not something that's supposed to come through the commission and that the commission should be thinking about and doing itself. Does that make sense? Yep. Information sharing, not dialogue. Yep. You can, or dialogue about stuff that anyone would be having dialogue about. It's, it's not something that the Human Rights Commission has to decide to do. Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Um, there was a motion I thought I saw um, so Deb has moved for uh, adjournment. Um, I second that. Uh, all in favor? Uh, that's unanimous. Thank you, everybody. And Thanks, I'll everyone. see you in a couple weeks, if Thank not before. You. So nice to see you all.